Hello viewers, uh, this is Dr. Kamar Shima and I'm thrilled to have with me Dr. Nilofar Sadiqi from University at El Pane, New York. Uh, she's assistant professor at the Rockefeller College of Public Affairs and Policy. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sadiqi, for your time. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. So, Dr. Sadiqi, you recently wrote a book uh, under the gun, Political Parties and Violence in Pakistan. Uh, can you just please tell us about your book? Uh, uh, what motivated you to write the book and what have you written uh, so that um, many people can go and buy, although it's all available, but uh, uh, it will be really interesting to listen that from the author. Sure, yeah. So um, as you mentioned, my book Under the Gun, Political Parties and Violence of Pakistan was just recently published by Cambridge University Press um, in the United States in November, and hopefully a box on edition will be coming shortly. Um, I was primarily interested in understanding, I was in Pakistan in uh, 2007, 2008, um, and during this time period, as you will remember, um, and even in the decades prior, there was a lot of violence, particularly in Karachi. And so we had parties with ethnic bases of support that were engaging in violence. Some of this was prior to elections. Some of this was in the periods in between elections. And what I wanted to understand was if a party's primary goal is to become elected, um, then how are voters responding to this violence, right? Why do parties utilize violence as a strategy? Um, it didn't seem like there was an intuitive answer because voters um, generally don't like violence, right? So generally voters will hold parties accountable if they engage in such behavior. Um, so what I wanted to understand was what are the circumstances under which voters hold parties accountable for violence? When might they be okay with the violence or when might they prioritize other factors over violence? Um, also, it was interesting that some parties in some regions would utilize violence, whereas in other regions, political or electoral violence was less common. And when I started to look at the range of strategies that parties employ, I was also interested in when political parties might uh, engage in alliances, electoral alliances, seat adjustments, campaigning together with non-state actors, so sectarian militant groups and so on. And so this became, you know, kind of a puzzle for me is so why would political parties pursue these strategies? And then even when we look beyond Pakistan, we see that this is quite common, right? So um, in I think about one in five elections since 1945, um, one in five elections have been characterized by violence involving civilian deaths. So this is not unusual, and this is much more common in um, developing democracies. So 60% of um, elections in the African continent have violence. Um, and we saw many examples of violence in Kenya and Nigeria, political parties outsourcing violence to various ethnic militias or gangs. And even when you look at perhaps more established democracies like India, so we have examples of the Shiv Sena, for example, which has um, routinely engaged in various forms of violence. It too has an ethnically uh, or linguistically defined base of support. And so what I was motivated by um, was kind of trying to understand this puzzle and because um, you know, I'm, I study Pakistan. I, I was using the case study of Pakistan to understand this question more broadly. So, Dr. Nilofar, Dr. Siddiqui, can you just tell us that uh, which political party you believe was using basically a violence as a, as a tool uh, for the further political influence? Uh, either that was because normally we hear about this is Karachi, but we have seen that this has also happened in Punjab as well. Uh, so what is your conclusion uh, about the political parties in Pakistan? Yeah, so, you know, in Pakistan, there was a period of time, as you mentioned, in Karachi, where we had a number of political parties who were engaging in um, some sort of violence, right? So we had uh, parties who were uh, engaging with the Layari gangs, for example. And so there is a lot of information that's provided, you know, about alleged links between the PPP and the Layari gangs. Um, there's a lot of information about the MQM. Um, for a period of time, even the ANP during Karachi in Karachi um, was supposed to be engaged in tit-for-tat violence um, with the various actors. But as you know, the ANP is less likely to engage in violence in KP, right? So we have some variation there. And then we have lots of examples of all of these mainstream parties also engaging in various forms of alliances with sectarian um, groups um, in Punjab, as you mentioned, and elsewhere. And so I do think that this was kind of a phenomenon that we see across the board. Um, there are different types of strategies that different parties employ, um, and there are different types of times um, when it's more likely and other times when they're less likely. Um, so not every party, I'm not suggesting that every party has a militant wing, 
um, or anything like that. And you yourself study um, Islamist political parties, right? And so that type of violence that Islamist political parties use is not covered in my book, but that's like a separate phenomenon as well. So Dr. Siddiqui, do you believe that uh, the political parties uh, were... Uh... Uh, where they are more divided on the basis of ethnicity, uh, they're prone to be more violent? Or do you believe that there is, uh, uh, where ethnically there is hom the hom they are homogeneous, there is a less violence? Uh, do you, where does your conclusion take you? On this. Yeah, that's a great question. Because, you know, at first glance, we would say, well, Karachi was very violent, in part because it's so ethnically heterogeneous, right? We have many different ethnic political parties, and much of the violence takes place along ethnic lines. But you know, when we look around the world, we have many examples of cities and countries that are ethnically divided, but don't have the same kind of violence, right? And so what I think about is, what are the circumstances in which ethnic voters will punish their ethnic political parties? And I think what, what it's less about ethnicity and more about the possibility that voters feel to vote for another party. So for long stretches of time in Karachi, Mohajir voters did not feel like they had another alternative besides the MQM, right? Ethnic polarization was so great that everybody voted along ethnic lines, not because they necessarily condoned violence or because they thought it was okay, um, but more because they felt as if, if they did not vote for their political party, they would not get goods and services, they would not get jobs, they would not have any representation. And so um, where voters, I argue in my book, that where voters feel like they are captive, right, where they're captive to a particular party, where they have no other alternative, that is when they're more likely to con not condone, but um, kind of turn a blind eye, you should say, to violence and prioritize other things. Now, what 2018 elections did in Karachi um, is the PTI provided after many decades, a new alternative, right? And so we did see, I mean, I think people talk about this election as being post-ethnic in Karachi, because for the first time in many years, the entry of the PTI allowed Karachi voters to feel as if they could vote for a different party, one that wasn't necessarily represented of their ethnic, um, of their ethnic identity. And so we saw a break, right? We saw something different happening in 2018, um, which was quite, you know, which was quite remarkable at some level, given the way in which ethnic voting had taken place over the last few decades prior. And, you know, when we think about, um, you know, what I, I like to emphasize is that it's not about ethnicity per se, because if it was about ethnicity, then it doesn't matter if you're a Pashtun in Karachi or if you're a Pashtun in KP, right? Um, if you don't, if you were going to vote for a violent party in Karachi, why wouldn't you vote for a violent party in KP? So it's not about ethnicity per se. It's really about the choices that voters feel like they have, because voters are ultimately rational. They're going to make decisions about what is best for them, right? What is where they're most likely to be able to get economic gain or feel comfortable or feel safe or see descriptive representation. So, uh, Dr. Siddiqui, how do you see what is the motivation of violence when we have seen in Punjab, for instance? Uh, uh, normally, when we talk about violence in elections, normally everybody goes to Karachi. Um, but what is the motivation of violence largely in um, in Punjab? Uh, because I, I come from Punjab uh, and, you know, I have also seen sometimes violence uh, in our localities or in our polling station, but normally that is mostly because of uh, on the basis maybe of the caste uh, on the basis of hierarchy within the society where the, where the people from the upper caste they want to have dominance uh, uh, so this is a matter of uh, respect and embarrassment now, if you are not getting um, if you are not going to win so what 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 is your motivation in punjab particularly if you because since you almost interviewed 150 politicians and hundreds of uh, members of the civil society and journalists and all that so what took you there yeah that's a great question as well because i do i think you're right that the dynamics in karachi and in the other parts of pakistan are quite different in punjab what i was most interested in is um when parties choose to bring on their party ticket individuals who may be um, unsavory in some way or the other, right? Individuals who have um, engaged in either, you know, like family feuds um, or 
are or allegedly affiliated with sectarian actors or, um, you know, have have these sorts of links. And so what I and because my interest is the political party, I think the other thing that I focus on besides the captive support base, which I just talked about, is the organizational structure of the political party. And so what I find that is happening in Punjab and other parts of Sindh as well, and some parts of KP, is that when parties are organizationally weak, they don't have the presence at the local level to put forward their own party members or party cadres, right? Because there's just no, um, there's just no uh, physical local level presence of the party. And the way the party is set up prevents it from having socialized party members who are willing um, you know, kind of to fight for the party at the local level. And so in the absence of this organizational capacity, parties turn to, as we know well, electables, right? And so we have electable culture in many parts of the country. Um, and here, the party decides whether or not this particular electable will get them enough votes, right? And so it's a combination of the electable vote, it's a combination of the party vote. Where the electable has enough votes, the party will turn to it right? And it will bring it on the ticket. If that electable happens to also be engaged in violence, the party might still have to turn to that electable if it wants to win that seat, right? And so in the past, we've had, I mean, and continue today, but particularly in the past, you know, we had feudal actors, right? And so very large feudals who controlled effectively state capacity in their particular area. So in their area, they had the monopoly of violence. And so this meant that the police was kind of under their control. They had armed militias and so on. And the party might not think that's really useful for them, but the party also wants to win a seat. And so they will just turn to the local electable. And so what we're seeing in parts of Punjab, especially, you know, parts of South Punjab, is a replacement of the feudal by like a sectarian actor, for example, as the local electable. And so the party will engage with them in kind of the same way because it's really about vote getting dynamics um, at the local level. And so you're right, we do see these kind of skirmishes, we see family um, feuds, we see clan dynamics, we see, might even see caste violence. Um, and these are kind of based on local level dynamics. And the reason when they move up to party level dynamics is when the party gives them a ticket. But they have a very different, um, it's a very different phenomenon as play, at play as you, as you outline. Well, there's another question, and that is related to the question of the capacity of the state uh, at, at times or, or, the, or the failure of the state. Do you think that the politicians, when they come in power, do they deliberately uh, keep institutions under the influencer control to manage, uh, uh, the, uh, to manage the elections, one thing? Or since they have already created this patron-client relationship, uh, back home, where they come from. So where do you see the, the role of the Pakistani institutions, in fact, uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, where they, they, they stay mum or they kept deliberately weak uh, so that the dominant party or the dominant group uh, can manage things the way they want to manage? Yeah, I think a big um, facet of this argument is weak state capacity, right? I think you're you're exactly right because um, where the state is present, we don't have really the presence of these electables. Sorry, I think I just lost you for a second. No, no, no. This is also one way to have okay. you. Okay, I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, so uh, where the state is present, right, where the state would be very present, then the state would have the monopoly of violence. Um, we wouldn't have these electables functioning in the same way. Uh, so what what we are seeing is that there is a lack of state capacity. And this lack of state capacity results in what I call contested state capacity. So um, in parts of uh, Punjab and Sindh, for example, we have this kind of relationship between the electable, the state, and the party, where the three are all kind of working together for state capacity, right? So who is, who is most in charge? In Karachi, the dynamics are different. Over there, as many people have written about, Geyer and his book has written about this, but there's no, mon nobody has the monopoly of violence, right? Every, there's so many different actors. They're all struggling with one another about who has state capacity. And so political parties, and I, it's very important to me that my book not be seen as like just an, a criticism of parties because parties are existing and functioning and developing in a particular political system, right? Parties have short-term horizons. They don't know if the rules of the game are going to change tomorrow. 
they have to make decisions based on short-term gain because the long run might look different. And so this means sometimes that parties will not invest in um, developing organizational capacity because it's not in their short term necessarily, right? And so um, I think the background factor is about which violence specialists exist to be potential allies of political parties, um, which gangs exist in Karachi, right? I think are, are often dynamics um, outside of the scope of the political parties. And so the political parties too are looking at what is in front of them, right? And making decisions based on the options they have and their fundamental goal, as is I think always the case for political parties, to win elections. So Dr. Siddiqui, how do you see the role of the military establishment? For instance, uh, we have had seen that um, they have been managing or we have seen a revolving door democracy. Either we have seen a hybrid regime, either it was Imran Khan who was termed uh, as a hybrid regime because uh, somehow the military establishment was supporting him. Um, by the way, once you, when, when you go for the research next time, you need to research the violence within the National Assembly. How the how the uh, how the political class is basically forced to vote, even in the national assembly, in the senate and the parliament. Forget what's going on on the street. So, how do you see this? Uh, uh, how do you see this uh, role of the military establishment um, uh, in all this? Do you think that uh, they have been complicit somewhere in supporting one party or to have them in power, or uh, uh, and what largely? How do you see them when it comes to the violence and in this? election ring? Yeah, so, um, you know, obviously, we can't have a discussion of Pakistan in a way without having a discussion of this. Um, it is not the focus of my book, right? So I am looking kind of at what are the decisions that political parties are making, given the parameters in which they exist. And so what we see is um, that there is variation even within the parameters. Now, of course, as we know, you know, the MQM, for example, has um, had a uh, military, paramilitary, police operations against them at times, and then at times that we, they come back, and then at other times the operation happens again. And so, of course, these dynamics affect how the party operate. Um, and then, you know, other scholars like Aisha Siddiqui, for example, have, has, have written about the dynamics between the military and the political parties, which it seems to me, um, at least for the purposes of my work, are, are inconsistent enough that they, it is not the sole explanation, I think, for the strategies that political parties employ. Because um, ultimately, voters are still making decisions, right? Um, they're making decisions given the options that are in front of them. And so what I want to understand is how and why do voters make the decisions that they make? Um, and of course, not, not to discount that there are other factors at play that also mold how people view parties, how the parties, how much um, ability the parties have to campaign freely, right? Who the electable chooses to join. Um, but, but for my purposes and for my book, I'm, I'm kind of interested more in the dynamic between the party and the state and the party and the voter. Hmm. So the last question that just came in my mind and that is about, did you really, did you ever focus on uh, uh, the coercion, the blackmailing? Uh, of the electoral college uh, um, while they are in the national assembly or they are in the in the political uh, or the provincial assemblies when they are forced to vote for uh, a particular you know party or particular issue or particular legislation did you ever find time to or did you see that no, I, this is such an important question. I think you're absolutely right that more research has to be done on this as well. My focus was primarily, as I mentioned, just with lo looking at the dynamics between parties and voters. So it was outside of the assembly. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I, I do think that there's a lot of different dynamics at play there as well. This is a dynamic that has just emerged in Pakistan. So obviously, I just had a question. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Siddiqui, for your time. And uh, thank you for writing uh, this wonderful book, Under the Gun, Political Parties and Violence in Pakistan. Obviously, this is a great book to uh, read uh, for the students and those who are interested to understand the Pakistani politics. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.